All right, everybody. Welcome, and thank you guys for joining us today. I think we are still missing quite a few people who've joined, uh, but we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, first, if you guys don't mind, I, I do have everyone muted, uh, and there is a chat window uh, in the GoToMeeting option. It just looks like a little cartoon chat box. If you guys do have any questions, please ask them through that. Um, I will periodically be checking that, but for now, I just wanted to verify if you guys are able to hear me right now. Uh, so if you guys are able, if anyone is able, please click on the little chat box and just state yes or no uh, if you're able to hear me. I'm going to assume if you can't hear me, you won't say no. And okay, thank you, Barbara. I'm, I'm, I'm able to see that. All right, very good. Okay, so I have a few um, things I'm going to touch on today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and one more chat. Uh, are you able to see my screen right now? It should say medical imaging. And yes, perfect. Okay, thank you guys very much. So I want to get started. I have a few notes that I'm going to uh, begin with. Uh, the first is that, unfortunately, I have a little bit of trouble actually sharing a slideshow of my PowerPoint presentation in GoToMeeting. So you guys will have to deal with the extra slides on the side, so please forgive that. Um, but I also do want to introduce myself. So you guys have uh, signed up for a webinar today. And I'm very grateful, not only that uh, you guys are willing to let me talk for about an hour to an hour and a half, um, but also you're allowing me to talk about something that I'm very passionate about. Um, so I do want to give you some background as to who I am. And this is both to give you some confidence in what you're, what you're about to hear me tell you. And it's also, I want you to also have some ounce of doubt as well. Uh, so to begin with, I've been involved in imaging of some sort for about six years now. Um, and I've been involved on two sides of it. I started out in a uh, wet lab, actually use, uh, dissecting mouse brains and cardiac tissue, which was a little bit gruesome for me, uh, but very, very interesting. Um, I actually imaged the tissue using fluorescent imaging. Uh, I left that, and I'm extraordinarily grateful that I left that, and I went into the engineering side of things. So on the engineering side of things, uh, I actually got involved in the analysis, the programming, the development of images from the numerical data. So I have kind of two different backgrounds of uh, basically to lend you guys uh, about how imaging works. And I also am going to note on that now I no longer do either. I now sell things for a living. Uh, so I don't want that to scare anyone, anyone off. Um, aside from seeing the name of the company that I work for, which is Anatomage, and on each slide, and mentioning very few things about our product, and also using the product at the end, the webinar itself will be very educational. So I don't want anyone to be scared off by that. Um, you know, I, I know the notoriety that salespeople get. I will try to keep that uh, on the on the down low for today's talk. Uh, so all that said, I do want you to keep in mind. I know quite a bit of what I'm going to be speaking about today but there will potentially be some mistakes along the way. Uh, some mistakes are admittedly actually on purpose. Uh, some of these mistakes I make just specifically because the concept is easier to understand by stating it in a more, in a, using a slight lie, I'll say. Um, those slight mistakes that I'll purposefully do should not impact the uh, aspect of the topic at all because the concept will be very accurate. There may be some mistakes that I make along the way that were not on purpose. If anyone catches those, please let me know so I stop extending these mistakes. Uh, I don't think there are many, though. So, you know, if you do catch these, please let me know, and I'll definitely import that into the next uh, webinars. Uh, just so you guys know, today's webinar, let me go ahead and move that on. It will be recorded, uh, but I won't have anybody's video. So nobody's face is going to be on here. There's a chance that your name might appear. I'm gonna be periodically checking our chat box and there's a good chance that your name might be on that window. If you are not comfortable with that, please go ahead and exit. We will be recording this and I will be sure to send this uh, recording to you, uh, but it should not be uh, at all invasive for the recording. Uh, we will be posting it to YouTube, uh, but and you're welcome to access it there as well. Everyone will be muted. So if you do have questions, as I mentioned before, please post them in the chat box. I will check these periodically. Uh, I will also ask a few questions, things like, can you see my screen? 
um, will be quite often whenever I swap windows. Uh, but additionally to that, it, I will be asking general questions throughout the talk. And if you want to, you're welcome to chime in on the chat box. If not, don't don't worry about it. Okay, so just to go through a couple bullet points on what we're going to be, be covering today, we're going to go through what the goal of imaging is, in particular medical imaging. So when you talk about medical imaging, it's a very, very broad field, and it also encompasses a lot of things that people don't think about. Um, so we're going to talk about what the goal of imaging is. We're going to be talking only about light imaging. There are other different types of imaging out there. We're not going to discuss those. Uh, we may touch on them, but we're not going to discuss that outside of the, uh, just basically touching on them. Uh, we're going to discuss several types of medical imaging. Uh, this is going to be photographs, x-rays, CTs, uh, and MRIs. So there are advantages and disadvantages to each, and we're going to go through that. And at the very end, we will actually be using Anatomage software to dissect each of these images. And the reason for that is because the dissection, essentially you're getting a two-dimensional image, and we're going to be dissecting a 3D version of it. And to me, there's nothing better in, to help you understand what the underlying physics of different types of images are than to actually see it uh, kind of in, in a regenerated version. So on that note, let's get started. And let me see, does anyone have any questions as of now? Uh, I'll keep up the screen just for a moment. So uh, if you do have questions, go ahead and click the chat box. All right, I don't see anybody going. So let's get off and running. All right. So the first question I'm going to ask is, I'm assuming people here, I, th I think everyone here is involved in some way, shape, or form in health science, uh, in nursing, allied health, uh, physical therapy, kinesiology, research, something along those lines. Um, you may have encountered MRIs. You may have encountered CTs. My first question is, has anyone ever gotten an MRI or a CT? And if so, which did you have done and why? You don't necessarily have to chime in on this, but I do want you to think about it. There's going to be a reason that you got a CT versus an MRI or an MRI versus a CT. So if you went in with a particular injury, think about what that injury was. Did you break a bone? Did you pull a muscle? Did you tear a tendon? Did What, what was the injury regarding and which modality was used to actually image that? And the next question, I, I always kind of get a kick out of this. Uh, I personally am a very, very, very curious person. I'm not the smartest person in the room, but when I see something happen, I'm always wondering what, how the, the thing works. And my family in particular has gotten an enormous range of medical imaging done for silly injuries. Most of my family never wonders how the heck these things work. And I think most people do not. The fact that you're here is a good chance that you've probably wondered this before. Um, you're taking time out of your day to actually attend a webinar on how these things work. So you've probably thought that, but I don't think many people do. So when we talk about imaging, we need to understand why it's actually a thing. So imaging came to be because you had the question of what is going on inside of the human body. Until any form of imaging was developed, in order to do this, you had to cut inside of the body. It was, you know, once you cut inside of a body, it kind of messes with the interior workings of the body and therefore you're not getting an accurate image. So it's an inherent problem. You know, I want to see inside the body, but in order to get inside of the body, I have to break the body. So the first thing we had was photographs and photographs were a fantastic tool, but the problem is photographs use visible light. And we're going to get into all that in a second. And visible light is not very good at seeing inside of things. It sees the surface of things. And so I mentioned photographs can only see the outside. They can't really see inside. There are some exceptions. And that exception is this image I show you here. This is actually my finger on my phone's light. And you can see a glowing red stemming from my fingers there. So we're going to actually talk about why that glowing red is there and what it means in a, in a couple slides. But even with that, you can see I'm going to, I'm going to say, state that the light is actually imaging the inside of my body in a way, but it's not really giving me very much info. I mean, everyone here knows you have, a, you have a bone inside of your finger. I can't see that bone. You have all sorts of capillaries. I can't necessarily see the capillaries. There's all sorts of stuff that is in there, and all I'm seeing is this glowing red. So I'm getting some information, but I'm not getting much. 
Uh, so photographs are not very good at imaging inside of the body. And I'm also going to state kind of broadly that in order to image anything, you have to use some kind of light or more generally some sort of electromagnetic wave. There is a very notable exception. And this one, everybody's welcome to chime in. Can anyone think of an imaging technology in, in the medical field that does not use light to extract information about the inside of the body? And if anybody feels comfortable, go ahead and put that in the chat box. And I'll keep it over for a, a minute here. Ultrasound, perfect. So a lot of people will actually mention uh, MRI, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. MRI actually uses light, but in a very funky way. Um, so that's not the exception in this case. Uh, ultrasound is going to be the case. And basically what it's doing is shooting sound waves through the body. And based on how the sound interacts with things and bounces back, you it lends you information about what's inside. We are not going to talk about that today, uh, namely because I don't know much about sound. Uh, but I know a good deal about light, and we're going to focus our talk on that today. We're going to start with what the heck light is. And light is where I get a little a little geeked out. Uh, the first thing I'm going to mention, I hope this, is a, get, this geeks everybody out in the room, is the formula E equals MC squared. I will just about guarantee everyone here has heard of it at one time or another. In fact, there's books and movies entitled E equals MC squared. It's Einstein's most famous formula, and even if you haven't gone to school, you've probably read it somewhere. What most people don't do is they're familiar with it, they're familiar with Einstein and all that, but they have no clue what this thing means. So I'm going to kind of walk step by step through it. So E stands for energy. M stands for mass. C is the speed of light. And the two is just squared. So it's the speed of light times the speed of light. What that means is, because it's an equation, what's on the left side is more or less the same thing as the right side, which means that energy can be you know, swapped, in a way, for mass and, and the speed of light, or mass moving at the speed of light, if you will. What it also means, if you think about it algebraically, is you don't need to just solve for energy. You know, Think about basic mathematics you know, back in middle school or high school. You can swap these, this, these numbers around and these variables around, and you can solve for matter or mass. You can solve for the speed of light. And what that gives you is energy is equal to mass and, and the speed of light. Matter or mass is equal to energy divided by the speed of light. So all I did was swing that, that C squared over. Or you can say the speed of light is equal to energy divided by mass. So that's a little bit mathy, but... What that's saying is any one of these things can be swapped or interchanged into the other, which means that light is kind of the same thing as mass, which is kind of the same thing as energy. That's kind of wild to think about. Everything in your room right now can be converted not to you know, a pillow or a chair, but it can be converted into light or it can be converted into energy. And if you don't believe me, this is the reason the atom bomb is a thing. You had this tiny little bit of mass, and they were able to get it moving at the speed of light, and that created a massive amount of energy, and that energy blew up an entire city. So this is very, very screwy if you stop and think about it. When you see light, when you see things, when you see anything with energy built into it, they're almost the same thing. And so that's the first thing I want you to kind of take in, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the basis of the rest of this talk. And that's the worst of the math that it gets, I promise. So all that said, let's actually look kind of on the, the tangible side of light. So you'll see the, the image here on the right where we have the nice rainbow, where you have violet on the left and you have uh, red on the right and everything in between. We're familiar with this rainbow. This is what photography uses. Whenever you take a picture with your phone, you're using visible light and you get these nice colors back, which most people forget, even if they are aware of it, they probably forget it. There is a huge amount of light outside of this visible sliver. And this, this image here is not to scale. Just to give you an idea, this, this sliver is really more like, let's say, a, a strand of hair on a yardstick. The strand of hair is the only tiny bit that we can see, and there's this whole yardstick left over. And you'll also notice that we have this 
undulating wave on top and it gets more squished and squished the further to the left that you go. What that's telling you is that the only thing that differentiates these different colors of light is this wavelength. It's basically how the light maneuvers through space, if you will. As it gets shorter, you know, towards the left, the energy goes up. And as the energy goes up, it actually becomes more dangerous light. And I'll explain that in a second. And if you go to the right, it actually spaces out and it becomes less dangerous light. And I always remember this, and I, I'm always slightly embarrassed to say this, but it doesn't stop me. The best way to remember this is the shorter these wavelengths are, you can picture it as the sound of wee, which is very high pitched and annoying. That's the dangerous side. When you get to the long, longer side, it's more like the sound woo, which is nicely slow and oscillating, which is the non-dangerous side. So that's a very quick and easy way to remember which is the dangerous, you know, high energy side. Okay, so we talked about visible light. I want to go into UV light just a little bit. UV stands for ultraviolet, and ultra means beyond, violet is violet. So we're beyond the violet side here. UV light is notorious for skin cancer. I live in Texas, and my family is French and Irish in descent, and I'm covered in freckles, and everyone in my family gets skin cancer. Uh, the cause of that is UV light. And what a lot of people don't think about, I think most people are familiar that UV light causes skin cancer, but you don't hear it cause, causing uh, bone cancer or muscle cancer or organ cancer outside of if you relate skin to an organ. So there's a reason for that. The UV light comes in and it hits your skin and it interacts with molecules in your skin, but it doesn't penetrate the skin. In fact, the skin is kind of is your, is your shield against this. But the inherent problem to that is that because it's eating up all this UV light, that UV light has enough energy when it interacts with molecules to knock electrons off those molecules. And it causes those molecules to behave poorly. And this process is called ionization. But what that means is that your molecules become cancerous. They, they function, they malfunction. And they start reproducing over and over and over and they don't follow the general rules. So UV light hits skin, it interacts with molecules, it causes cancer, but it doesn't go any deeper. So if we're talking about medical imaging, we're trying to see inside of the skin. That's a problem because UV light doesn't go through the skin. So, and it causes cancer. So it's two things that aren't beneficial to what we're aiming at. If we keep going, we get into X-ray and X-ray is even higher uh, energy. Well, higher energy means it's more ionizing, which means again, dangerous. But x-rays have the benefit that they're actually able to penetrate skin and they're actually able to penetrate other types of tissues as well at differing amounts. And we're going to talk about that in particular in a second. So it is ionizing. It's a dangerous, it's a dangerous light wave, but it has some benefits. If you go into gamma rays, which is even, even more energetic, I actually know even less about gamma rays. I, I can't talk much on it, but I have seen the Incredible Hulk and he was... Uh, exposed to gamma rays. And so anything that turns you into a giant green monster is probably not good. Um, I do know that it has some medical purposes. There's something called a gamma knife, I believe, which is used to attack cancers. Um, it, I don't know much about that though, but you're welcome to look that up. But keep in mind, as we go further and further left here, you're basically getting more and more cancerous or potentially cancer causing, let me say that, but each different type of wave has its benefit. If we go the other way, we go to the long side. You start with infrared or IR. Infra means below and red means red. So we're now we're below red. Well, infrared rays have a very interesting um, fact about them. And it's the fact that it's invisible light, yet we can sense it. So when you think of anything with light, you think you must view it with your eyes. You know, there's no way outside of that to view or to sense light. But infrared rays, we actually feel. We actually feel it as heat. And in fact, that's why we, we can use thermal cameras using infrared light. And you get that nice heat map whenever you view it at night. Um, it's also the reason that coastal regions are, um, are more temperate than continental regions. You're surrounded by a huge body of water and infrared rays, and instead of interacting with skin like UV light did, infrared rays interact with hydrogen molecules in water. 
and it makes them shake and it warms them up. So it absorbs the energy, it shakes the water and it heats it up. So in hot summer months, the big bodies of water will absorb the infrared rays. They'll keep the temperature of the surrounding land cooler. And then in the winter, that infrared energy will actually be emitted back out from the water and keeping the, the, uh, the uh, land actually uh, hotter in the winter months. Uh, if you've ever used, uh, excuse me, if you've ever lived in a hot summer month area, such as Texas in my case, I know there are plenty more outside of that. Um, we love air conditioning. And when it is 100 degrees outside, it is about 60 degrees inside of any building. And as wasteful as that is, you will show up to work and when COVID is not in, in the, in the uh, world right now. You'll show up to work and you'll have a sweater on and you'll be freezing cold inside your office. You'll step outside after several hours in the office and you'll stand in the sunlight. The sun coming down will have infrared light in it. That infrared light will actually hit your skin. It will actually go through your skin. It'll hit your muscles and it'll start interacting with water molecules in your muscles, warming your muscles up. It'll hit your bones and any water molecules that are present there will it'll start bouncing those around and warm those up. So that feeling you get when you step outside of a freezing cold office into the summer you know, heat, it's fantastic for like five minutes because you feel like you're in this wonderful deep sauna that's just warming every molecule in your body. Ten minutes later, you're drenched in sweat and you're ready to go back inside. But it's infrared light that causes this really nice feeling. So these are. This is also has has its uses in medical uh, field as well. It's it's often used for, I believe, tumor Im imaging. Uh, you get a kind of a heat map on the tumor as well. Uh, so then we'll go into microwave and radio waves, and we'll talk a little bit briefly on microwaves and even more briefly on radio because we're going to talk about that specifically in a moment. Microwaves we use every day when we cook up food in the microwave, and microwaves have the same characteristic as infrared waves that they like to interact with water. And when you heat up food, the thing that's heating up is its microwaves are going into the, the food, bouncing the water molecules around, and it's heating up the water essentially in your food. Uh, an experiment that is incredible, but I will state and do not try at home, put in a glass of water and a paper plate into your microwave, turn it on and let it in for a couple minutes and see which gets hotter, the water or the paper plate. And you'll find that the water can actually cause severe burns. So that's why you shouldn't do it. It can actually apparently explode in your face when you take it out. So don't do that. Um, it gets extraordinarily hot. The paper plate gets mi mildly warm. And it's mildly warm essentially because the paper may have picked up like uh, atmospheric hot water from the air. Um, but it, it's, you can grab it. You, it. It's hardly warm at all. So microwaves have the same inherent aspect as infrared rays that they like to interact with this water. And then radio waves we're going to talk about in a second. So what I want you to get from this is as you get high, shorter and shorter wavelengths towards X-rays and UVs and gamma rays, it becomes dangerous, it becomes ionizing radiation. When you move in the other direction, these wavelengths get longer. They tend to like water and they're safe, safe in the sense that they're not going to cause cancer. They can still cause damage. Okay, I'm going to take a quick second. Does anyone have any questions on that? I know that was that was deep into light in part just because that's my my love here. So I'll give it just one moment. If any anyone has a question, go ahead and ask. Here we go. Oh, sorry, Betty. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'll send you the um, the link when we're done. Okay, so I don't see any more questions and we'll continue on. So now we're going to actually talk about the types of imaging. So now you have an understanding that light is incredibly weird. It's not what you think it is. And it has a lot of, it's, it's all the same thing, but it's incredibly different depending on these wavelengths. So the first uh, type of imaging we're going to talk about is a photograph. This is the one that everyone is completely familiar with. And the photograph, I like to say, is the most understandable image that we can produce. What that means is when we take a photograph, you don't have to have any sort of fantastic education to understand what's going on there. You don't need to know what it is. You just know that this is the same thing that my eye sees. So it's, it's very obvious. It uses visible light. So it uses that rainbow that we, that we talk about. But the question I want you to think about is, is a, when you see a photograph, is it real? And that's a very weird question. Uh, I have a couple kids at home and it's a question they would ask and you would kind of dismiss it. 
but it's a good question. The reason that it's a good question is these are all pictures of me. I'm sorry, not they're not more handsome versions of me, but I did what I could with, with the subject. Um, so these are all the exact same picture, but what I did was I had a light bulb and I just held it in different locations of my face. And you can see each picture is quite different from the other. And the question would be, which image looks the most like me? I mean, it sh they should all look quite a bit like me um, because it is me, but they all look very different. So what I want you to gain from this is when you see a photograph, and, and I'll, get, I'll get into that in a second. When you see a photograph, it is a model of the reality that you took. It is not real. It is almost real. It is somewhat true. And the, another way you can think about this is I grew up out in the country in the middle of nowhere and we had wonderful stars. You could look up in the sky and there were stars everywhere. And occasionally you'll try to take pictures of the stars and you maybe use your phone. And when you do that, you see this beautiful sky of stars and then you take a picture of it and you look at your phone and you, you don't see anything. It's just a black mess and it doesn't look like anything. So clearly what you're looking at is not what you saw. And so the, the combination of that is when you take a photograph, it is almost real. It, ha it provides you with information about the reality, but it doesn't provide you the reality. And what I want to extend in this is when we get into this other type of imaging, this exact statement accounts to all of them. So when you get into, we're going to get into CT, we're going to get into all these other ones. All of these are a model of what is truly there. It's not perfect. It is not the real thing. Okay. Next is invisible light. And this is really where we're going to hold the rest of the conversation. So scientists, if we have any scientists here, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth. Uh, but I think, I think I'm pretty confident in stating this. Scientists love invisible light. We use it, or scientists use it in almost every field. Uh, if you've ever seen pictures of nebula, which is what I grabbed here, I grabbed this from the Hubble Telescope website, which is really fun if you ever get a chance. Um, when you click on an image, it'll tell you how they took the picture, so you can figure out what type of uh, light they used. The, in these images, you'll see the top left is visible plus IR. IR is infrared. On the far right, it's just infrared, and on the bottom, it's UV. So each one of these, aside from the visible and infrared, actually gives you an image of something that you never would have seen with your eyes. It did not exist in, that, in your reality. What we, what we did was basically have a camera that is, has a filter that only allows certain wavelengths of light to get through. And it acts kind of like a Polaroid. The infrared lights are the, the invisible rays come in and they hit this kind of Polaroid screen, if you will, and you get intensity values. The intensity values just say how many photons or how many particles of light made it through at that you know, region of the light spectrum. And you get these like dots in the, in the picture that give you this, this information. The, these colors, though, that we applied, well, UV light and infrared light don't have colors attached, or at least colors in the sense that you're familiar with. So what we do is, is just kind of like old movies. When you have a black and white movie, you add color to it. And that color, you, when you see the black and white movie with color in it, you realize that that's not real. You see it, you can tell. It's not quite the right colors, but it's close enough and you have an idea. So the process of this is the same to that, except we've kind of invented what different values ha are in colors. You know, th this little greenish blue um, little circle here is not necessarily this wonderful color. It, we've just said, okay, anything of those intensity values has that color. So we've added these and we've created this invisible world. We've made it now visible. And the next question is, can you hear light? And this is another thing that everyone is familiar with and almost no one knows. The reason a radio is called a radio is because it uses radio frequency light. And a radio station will broadcast or emit radio light in every direction. And your radio has this wonderful antenna that picks up these, these waves of light and converts those into sound. And the information is carried on these light waves, you know, 
long, long, long distances. And if you've ever heard the term AM and FM radio, AM stands for amplitude modulation and FM stands for frequency modulation. When we talked about those wavelengths of light, the frequency has to do with how wide those waves were and the amplitude has to do with how tall those waves were. And in order for radio stations to send out all this different information, each one of them has to have a radio station. And that station is called essentially a carrier frequency. So the carrier frequency has some frequency attached and it's like a code built into the, the, um, built into the original wave. So if you have one wave that goes up and down, you might have an FM radio that goes up and down that fast. You might have another one that goes up and down that fast. For amplitude, you'll have ones that are very tall and ones that are very short. So, you know, whenever you think of light, it's not what you think it is. You can hear it, you can feel it, it can be converted into things. And now, how is this used in medicine? So first we deal with photography uh, or visible light. Visible light is used in microscopy and endoscopy, which are two versions of photography. Microscopy is basically you have a you know a small slide. In this case, it, this is a, a bone slide. And you zoom in very, 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 very close to it. And in many cases, you can take a photograph. That's, that's how photography is often used. Uh, if you ever go to the skin doctor and they take photographs of moles, that can be photography on that. Uh, endoscopy is where you actually put the camera on a tiny little wire and you embed it into the body. So you can put it through the mouth, through other ends, and you actually are viewing the inside. The problem with this though is even with endoscopy, even though you're inside the body, your field of view is very small. If you're, let's say, in the, in the throat, you can't see outside of the throat uh, using endoscopy. So it's wherever you, you're locating the camera. Um, so this is kind of how photography is used. Let's talk about the invisible side. So we'll start with x-rays and we're gonna get into more complex versions uh, beyond this. We touched on them a little bit earlier, but x-rays are very, very high energy light waves. They are, they are ionizing, which again, just means that these waves are interacting with molecules and knocking electrons off, causing the molecules to behave poorly. This can cause cancer. Um, as I mentioned before, take everything I say with a grain of salt. If your doctor says, get an x-ray, go get an x-ray. It doesn't mean you're going to get cancer. When you ha have an x-ray, it just increases risk. Uh, it's like smoking one cigarette versus smoking many for a lifetime. Um, so x-rays can penetrate skin, they can penetrate muscle, and they can penetrate bone. The reason that we get this wonderful image out is because it penetrates each of these at different amounts. So it penetrates skin about 100%. It penetrates muscle at, let's say, 80%, and it penetrates bone maybe about 10%. What that means is it creates a gradient or kind of a... A, uh, a shadow effect that is not consistent for each type of tissue. The bone stops the x-ray almost completely, meaning that it creates the largest or, or most dense shadow. And what you get is actually this inverse sat shadow or inverted sat shadow where everything that is blocked, which is the bone, is white. Normally on a shadow, you know, if you look in your shadow on the, the sidewalk, the shadow is very dark. The difference, the, the reason that this is kind of inverted is because when x-rays were first around, they started with placing like this screen of silver behind the patient. And the patient would stand in front of the screen and the x-rays would be shot through the patient and they would hit the screen of silver in the back. Silver is silver, it's very light colored. But when the x-rays hit the silver, it burns it and it turns it darker. So wherever the x-rays were blocked, it stayed light. And that's the shadow effect. Wherever the x-rays were not blocked, it was dark. So you get this darker effect. And now it's, it's mostly digital. So it, you know we could have easily swapped that around because it's on a computer, but I think for convention's sake, that was kept. Um, what this kind of image is known, known as, it's this black, white, and a little bit of gray in between, is known as grayscale. Grayscale is basically a black and white image where you have these kind of modulations of, of gray in between. The next type of imaging that I want to talk about is computed tomography. Computed tomography is a very cool version of an x-ray. It is a three-dimensional x-ray. And if you can picture this image here, uh, we have the same person, his, his or her head is black with gray shoulders and they're laying on a white bed. This little black 
uh, nodule here that's rotating around the circle is the X-ray emitter. That's think of that as the camera, right? That's or let's say that's the the light emitter. On the back end is the detector. What it's doing is it's first taking a photograph using X-ray in this direction and it records it. Then the X-ray rotates and it takes it in this direction and it records it. And then it rotates again and it takes it in this direction and records it. You're taking hundreds if not thousands of different angled photographs of the same person or object or structure. Those images are actually able to be loaded into a computer and, re and used to recreate a three-dimensional version of your object. So now all of a sudden you've developed a three-dimensional camera, but instead of using visible light, you're using x-rays. So just as the fact that uh, x-rays are very good at, at showing bone tissue, CT scans show the same thing. The problem though is, is it's not very, for the most part, it's not very good at distinguishing soft tissue. So I often say that CTs image bone versus everything else. It can basically tell you this is bone, this is not bone. There's little tweaks to that that can be done, but, but that's kind of the basics of that. So I'm about to show a video, but let me check to see if anyone has any questions. So I'm hoping the video will work. It will be on YouTube, so if there's an ad, forgive me. Um, okay, I don't see any questions. And I hope you guys enjoy this video. Um, I will quickly pop it up and I will ask you guys. Okay, hold on. Okay, let me, I have to reshare my screen here. Okay, so can you guys see my screen? Could you guys just give me a yes or no on that? Okay, yes. Okay, very good. Okay, so what this is, is a CT scanner with its top off. And you're about to see how fast these things rotate. So keep in mind what you have, I believe this is actually the x-ray emitter here. This is the detector here. I could totally be wrong about that. So if I'm wrong, I apologize, but just to give you an idea, you have an x-ray on one side and a detector on the other. And we're gonna go ahead and play it. And so somebody here is working on this CT scanner. And while they're doing, while they're working on it, I don't know if they just decided to film it for fun or if they need, if they actually served a purpose for it. But picture your head being in the middle of this, not knowing that this is going on around your head because there's a cap on it that blocks your view of this. This thing goes incredibly fast, and it takes hundreds, if not thousands, of photographs of your head. So it's a phenomenal uh, uh, contraption. It, the, the way that they've developed it, I think, is absolutely brilliant. Um, but as you can imagine, it, there's quite a bit that goes into it. And what you get from that, as, as before, is you're getting this three-dimensional image of your body from the inside out. As I mentioned, though, CTs are not great at seeing soft tissue, but there's an exception to that. There's what's called CT angiography. And what this does is keeping in mind that an x-ray is telling you the difference of density. You know, it's shining through skin 100%. So skin has very little density according to an x-ray. It shines through bone and muscle, you know, less so, but still quite a bit. So bone and muscle have a little bit more density than skin. It doesn't shine very much through bone, bone being very dense according to an x-ray. Well, if you want more information, say, of a particular organ or, say, of blood vessels in this case, what you can do is inject what's called a contrast agent into the body, time it so that this contrast agent arrives at the location that you need to image at the right time, and then you image. And what this contrast agent does is change the, the, the density of the object that is inside of. So in this case, it's inside of blood vessels. It has a, a more dense substance in those blood vessels now. So when the CT is, is shine, or when the X-ray is shining through, it's going to tell you, okay, this thing is really dense. That's bone. This thing's kind of dense. That's going to be whatever has the contrast issue or contrast agent. And then this other thing, which would be bone and, or excuse me, muscle and fat, et cetera, is very not so dense. So now you have, instead of saying bone versus everything else, you have bone versus whatever has a contrast agent in it versus everything else. 
so now you can actually get more information about it. And it's very, very useful, particularly in viewing blood vessels. Okay, and now we're on to my favorite. So magnetic resonance imaging is probably the most confusing of all of these different imaging types. An x-ray more or less is kind of like a photograph. You're shining light, a type of light through and you're recording a shadow back. So I think of it kind of like a Polaroid. It's not exactly like that, but it, it makes some sense to it, right? You're just creating a shadow of your bones. A CT scan is more complex. You're spinning it around and you're getting three dimensional views of this, but it's still the same idea. With MRI, it doesn't work exactly like that. So there's a lot of theories that, that are kind of led to the development of MRI. And the first of which, and the most important of which, is the body is composed of a whole bunch of water. And last I checked, I want to say it's like 70% of it. Forgive me. I, I think I knew this at one time. I'm sure someone in this room knows, but it is a lot of water. And water is H2O. Water has two hydrogens for every oxygen. It's a lot of hydrogen. And it just so happens that hydrogen is number one on the periodic table. And if everybody remembers back in chemistry, if, if you're doing chemistry now, great. It, it's been a long time. I'll, I'll, I'll freshen you up. If hydrogen is number one on the periodic table. That means it has one proton, one electron. And if you think about that, proton is a positive charge and an electron is a negative charge. So that means that you have a positive charge here and a negative charge here. That is a magnet. The funny thing is though, the electrons moving around in every which way, it doesn't defeat the fact that it's still a magnet. It's just rotating. The magnet is rotating all the time. And if you notice, these are my little um, uh, hydrogen molecules that I've created. And the alignment of the ma each magnet is going in whatever direction it wants to go in. So overall, the magnetic field of your body is essentially nothing because everything's canceling itself out. But what you can do is put the body inside of a huge magnet, a very powerful magnet. And what this does is actually take all of these magnets and, it, and a small, tiny fraction of them will be pointed in the same direction as the big magnet. And then the rest of them will be pointing in the opposite direction, parallel, and I believe it's anti-parallel. Parallel just so happens you need a little bit less energy to do it and a little bit more energy to do anti-parallel. So what this gives you is a small, a magnetic field that the body possesses all of a sudden. Small fraction, but if you think of it, there's, let's say, trillions of hydrogen molecules. So if you have one every million, you get a whole bunch that are pointing in this direction. So now all of a sudden you have this kind of alignment in the body. But the problem is even with the alignment, the electron's still moving and they're still kind of tilting in the wrong direction. So you're not getting exactly this, this big field you want to get. So what is done is you take a radio frequency pulse, which again is essentially it's a, an electromagnetic wave, and you shoot it on. And that's the thing, it's, it's, I believe it's called a gradient, and that's the thing you hear click, 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 click whenever you're in an a MRI machine. And it knocks these, these, or these magnets over. So not, not, they were up, up and down, and then it knocks them 90 degrees to the side. Well, when that pulse turns off, each of these magnets wants to return to their original direction, let's say up in this case. But depending on what, what kind of tissue they were in, whether it be bone or muscle or fat or water or air or whatever it was, it will take a different amount of time for it to bounce back up. And when it bounces back up, it releases uh, energy. And that energy is released in radio frequency light, which is then detected and you get these wonderful differences between different types of tissue because of this timing. And there's actually multiple timing points that are measured, and those actually give you different types of images. Depending on which uh, timing mechanism you're controlling for your, or you're measuring, you can actually get different information based on the image. But if you look at each of these images, you can actually clearly see you know, designations of different types of tissue in a brain. And that is where it differs significantly from something like CT. Not only are you getting bone versus other, you're getting this type of soft tissue versus this other type of soft tissue versus this other type of soft tissue. So now you're getting a huge amount of information here. Okay, 
we're almost done here and then I'm going to pause for questions. Um, and then we're also going to uh, dissect some, some images here in a second. So first, we're going to talk about the advantages. So a photograph. We are basing every single one of these technologies, MRI, CT, everything, on a photograph. We are trying to turn it into a photograph because we understand photographs. Photographs have the best re resolution of anything. Uh, phones now have enormously fantastic resolution. Uh, the photograph is, in that sense, the gold standard of, of imaging. Everything is being compared to the photograph. The CT scan allows you to see, see inside the body. So now all of a sudden we don't have to, you know, cause damage to the body to see inside. It does have very good resolution and it can see bone phenomenally. But, the, but oh, and it also can see soft tissue, but you have to add a few tweaks, which would be that angiography. Um, and then MRI, it also can allow you to see inside the body, just like CT. It now allows you to see different types of soft tissue. So all of a sudden you're not stuck with seeing CT versus other. Now you know all the, all the different information. And it doesn't cause cancer. It's non-ionizing. So very useful technology. There are disadvantages. With a photograph, it's very obvious. In order to see inside of a body, the body has to be dead. So no matter how good your photograph is, you're going to have to cause damage to the tissue in some way, shape, or form. With CT, it's ionizing. So you can't have too many CTs in one, you know, in one year, essentially. Um, it doesn't highlight soft tissue as well as MRI. And with x-rays, x-rays in particular, it's all light, but with x-rays in particular, if you have a large uh, amount of tissue, the x-rays will do what's called attenuate. It, it will, the resolution fades over distance. So if you think of just a flashlight, when you have a high beam in the very first few feet, it's very, very bright, but over distance, it starts to fade. X-rays do the same thing, but in tissue. Uh, with MRI, the resolution is hindered by the power of the magnet. So you, when you put the body inside of a magnet, it has a certain power. The higher the power, the better your, your, uh, the, the hydrogen molecules align and the better your signal will be. But the higher the power of the magnet means the more expensive it is. And these are not cheap, multi-million dollar systems. It also means that it is more dangerous. In fact, if the, if the power of the MRI is high enough, the iron in your blood can actually start to, to shake and cause problems. And they actually have MRIs now that humans are not allowed to enter because the power is so high. Um, so MRIs do have their disadvantages there. The things I want you to take away from the PowerPoints, and then we're, we're going to get into the thing that I think everything will hit home, is first, different tools will serve different purposes. You don't need, you know, a, a photograph is only going to give you information about the outside or, you know, some, some particular information. A CT is going to give you very good bone info. An MRI is going to give you very good soft tissue. But each of these have limitations. Each tool is only partially accurate. No one tool gives you every answer. And, but if you frame your, your question correctly and you use the right tool, you can get the answer you need. And then finally, I hope you guys start thinking, if you haven't already been thinking about light, you start digging into it because it's very, very fun. Okay, so first, does anyone have any questions? Thank you for sitting around for that. Uh, okay. That was the talk, and we're about to jump into the fun part. And I do appreciate you sitting around listening to me for roughly an hour now. All right, I don't have any questions yet. If you guys do have questions, feel free to pop them up. And if I don't get to them during the talk, uh, please email me, and I will gladly answer them offline. If you guys need to contact me, first off, our website is anatomage.com. Uh, you can find more information about what we're about to get into. And my, my email is jperry at anatomage.com, and my phone number is also listed. I am based out of Texas, even though I have a California number. Uh, our company is out of California. So feel free to call, email, or text, and I'm happy to answer anything I can. Okay, now let me go ahead and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to pull up our first dissection tool here. Okay, share screen. Okay, can everyone 
see my cadaver here. And if you will, okay, I think Jackie, yeah, okay, thank you, Jackie. All right, so this is a cadaver based on photography. It, it is a virtually render, 3D rendered body, which is why it does look animated, but it is based off of these photographs. So this individual was actually frozen solid at the time of her death, and her body was slowly ground away layer by layer. It was a very gruesome uh, process, but it lent phenomenal uh, outcome. And, and she did volunteer for this, so this was not pulled, uh, pulled from someone not willing. So what I wanna point out, these are her toes right here. As I scroll up through here, you'll actually see we go up through thighs, we get through the mid midsection, you actually see an orange box appear up here. This is the slice that we were in. If you've ever heard of an MRI slice or CT slice, it's the 2D cross section that is representative of the 3D hole. What you can do is actually select things in the 2D image. It will actually outline them here. Um, but what we're actually gonna do is dig through this body to find particular things that I, I'm cheating a little bit because I already know happen to know they're there but I'm gonna show you why photography is so fantastic. So each one of these slices is, is sub millimeter. It is extremely high resolution and the color itself, the real color actually lends boundaries better than most other technologies. So not only is the resolution better, but you also have this added benefit of the color where the, you, you lose out on the MRI and the CT. And that gives you the ability to do things like this, where we actually have these, oh, wrong button, where we actually have these um, different structures outlined and highlighted. It also allows you to remove structures layer by layer, because we can actually outline those throughout the whole body. But what we're going to do here is dissect. So I happen to know the reason this individual died. Uh, she had gastric cancer. And again, because we're dealing with a photograph, we can explore this a little bit better. Uh, you can do what we do with an MRI or CT to an extent, and we're going to do that next, but not to use here. So bear with me because it's going to do some calculations in the background, and I have a lot going on on my computer right now. Um, but what we're going to do, this individual died at 26 of gastric cancer. We're going to find her stomach, and we're going to find a little specialty uh, that was basically her body created as a workaround. Uh, beyond that, she has a, a, a metastasis of the cancer and she also has an injury to the head. And we're gonna look at this in different ways on, on, the, on the photograph here. So bear with me. All right, and what it's doing is calculating the volumes of each of the tissues below that have been outlined. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in and give it just a second. And what I can do is actually select tissue by tissue to remove these. And when I get to the stomach, I will stop. Move those. Okay, so now I'm gonna click on the stomach and you see it's outlined and you also see it's notated as gastric cancer. Well, the cancer happened to block her stomach and her stomach from what I understand uh, was in, uh, engorged, it, it grew, because no food could pass through, and it actually uh, touched the intestines, and the intestines and the stomach over time actually merged into one, creating a new opening. This new opening is this gastric fistula here, and what we can do, and again, this is in part due to the photography aspect of it, I can actually use this tool here to highlight that fistula, and I can click it again to zoom in on that. So I'm gonna actually show you the inside of this. So let's zoom in. And you can see the resolution on it. You can see actually the, you know, the ruffles in the stomach, or excuse me, in the, in the inners, and you can actually see the openings here. You'll also see that we're zooming in a lot, and there's really little pixelation on this. This is the resolution of the photographs. This is what photography lends you. The problem with the photography though, and let's go ahead and bring her back. The problem with the photography is if, as you recall with the photographs, she was ground away. By the end of that process, she is dust. There is no more body at the end of this. 
So while it lends a terrific tool, it has its shortcomings. So in addition to this fistula here, I'm gonna make a more abrupt cut and we're gonna find uh, where the cancer moved. So I'm gonna get to the vertebrae and you'll see the vertebrae start to appear here. And as I come through it, I want you to find is follow the vertebrae up and right to about where we get to her neck and you'll see right here. So let's zoom in. Okay. When we get here, I can actually click on it. And you'll see it's the first thoracic vertebrae. And what I want you to note is each one of the vertebrae has quite a bit of support left until you hit here. And there's almost nothing in between these two, um, uh, the two supports. So I'm going to use that same tool here. Oh, wrong button. I'm going to use that same tool here. And let's see if I can uh, rotate it over. There we go. And I'm gonna click there, there we go. I'm gonna undo the cut here. And what I wanna show you is this vertebrae. I have been told that this vertebrae is actually cancerous. And you'll note that this little sliver of bone here is what was supposed to support her neck. Clearly, that is not gonna do a very good job. In addition to that, this is the spinous process. And if I'm not mistaken, that's about two to three times bigger than it really should be. So everything I know about this, and I am not an anatomist, but this is a very unhealthy vertebrae. And it seems as though her cancer may have spread. So keep in mind again, this individual is 26. So she has gastric cancer, which is one of the more painful of the cancers. And she has a neck that doesn't support anything. So I can imagine this, this individual is not in the most comfortable uh, of, of circumstances. So let's go ahead and bring her back. Let's undo that explore tool. Here we go. And what I'm going to do here is our last exploration on the photograph. So I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to undo my cuts. So let's click undo and click undo. Give it just a minute. And what we're going to do, she also had an injury to her face. So we're going to explore that a little bit. In order to do that, I'm going to peel away some skin here and I'm going to get down to the bone. I'm going to zoom in. Okay, and then I'm going to take this and I'm going to get up to her face right about there. Okay, and let's zoom in. Oops, wrong button. Let's zoom in there. Okay, so we're going to be looking at her, her left cheekbone, I believe. If you actually look on the 3D rendering, you'll see little dark divots along her cheekbone and around her eye socket. And we're going to look right around here. And what we should find is several screws. Unfortunately, I don't have the background story to this, uh, but you can actually, you'll, we'll be able to pinpoint the screws here. So I'm going to scroll through this. And as I go up, we should actually see small black T's appear, I believe, right there. So I'm going to take a pin here. And we're going to count these. I think we should get to 11. So there's one, if you notice right there. We'll keep going. And there is two right there. There is three right there. We keep going. I think they appear further up. There we go. Four right there. Five right there. Six right there. Seven. We got about four left. I think they appear further down. Okay. There's eight right there. There's nine. There's 10. And there's 11, a little bit hidden under my arm. So this individual had gastric cancer, uh, cancerous vertebrae, and a very fractured uh, face, and died at the age of 26. So I want everybody to keep that in mind. All of this, You'll see this image here. This is a 2D photograph of her brain. You can see clearly the designations of the different types of tissues. You can see the different colors and outlines of all this. This is all present specifically because it was a photograph. But after this photograph, this person was dust. There was nothing left. Okay, so now let me minimize. We're going to go to a CT scan. And I think. Can you guys now see a skull, a skull in a 2D gray image? And does anyone have any questions actually as well? Let's 
Let's see. Just make sure if if anybody could just uh, let me know that you can see the skull. And Jackie, I think. Okay, perfect. Okay, so here we are. Okay, so this is a CT scan. On the right, you'll see the 2D slice, and on the left, you'll see the 3D rendering. I will bring in the tissue. Note these eyes are not actually there. We put those there to anonymize the individual, so don't, don't, uh, don't think those were present. What you will see on the CT scan is there is soft tissue. This is skin. But as I remove it, it just goes from skin to bone. There's not really anything in between. That's when I tell you that the difference in a CT, or excuse me, what a CT lends you is the difference between bone and other. You can see that as well on this 2D image. You'll see the big white sliver of bone and then the gray other. There's a tiny bit of darker gray in the middle here, and those are ventricles. That's empty space, or it's fluid-filled space. Uh, so you do see a little bit of a difference there, but not much else. It's mostly just this massive white stuff and gray. What you'll also note is around here you have this skull, which should be a full circle, but there's a nice big gap here. Well, that gap, let's see it in 3D. Okay, we got a big hole. Okay, let's explore the 2D image a little bit more. So we can go up, let's start going down. If we go down, oh, we have this glowing object here. Well, that glowing object, if you, it even has like a halo effect around it. It has this beaming uh, rays coming out of it. Well, we're looking at X-rays, right? A CT shines X-rays in multiple dimensions. And X-ray, if you've ever gotten one, is blocked by lead. That's why when you get an X-ray of your head, they'll give you a lead vest to wear. That lead vest protects the rest of your body that doesn't need to be imaged from harmful radiation, which is the X-ray. Well, other things that are made up of lead would be bullets. And in this case, we have a bullet residing in a head entered through this nice, wonderful hole. So let's rotate the, the brain over a little bit, or the skull over a little bit, and we have the bullet right in here. We can view it from a different angle as well, from the top, you can actually view in here, and you'll see that the bullet is still residing in the head. Uh, what I also wanna show you now is instead of just bringing the outer skin in, we can actually bring in the brain. So now we have soft tissue, and if you notice, it basically looks like a mess of white noise. I mean, it's like static that you see on your TV. There's not much information you're getting from this, other than that it's not bone. We know this is bone and then this is something else. So very useful in the sense of bone. I mean, you can come back here and you can see how good the resolution is on this bone. But the problem is you're not getting information about what different types of tissue there are outside of that. So that's where the limitation for the CT is. Now we're going to pull in the CT angiogram. So this is where... We, we go a step further with a CT. And again, let me just make sure you guys are seeing a new head here. Um, if you could just send me a, just send, submit a text just saying that you're, or a chat that you're seeing it. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so this is a CT angiogram. And again, these eyeballs are not real. We've added those. But the angiogram, let's start with the 2D image. Oops, wrong bar here. I want this one. So we're going to go up. The reason we want to go up is because when you get to the brain, and when you get to the brain, you notice we have the skull, and we have this gray stuff in the middle, but you also have this little spider web looking thing in the gray. So now let's see what that is. So again, they, they inject a contrast agent. The contrast agent arrives at a certain location in time, and they image that location. What that gives you is this. So now when I add tissue in, let's zoom in. Now you can see each one of these vessels. And as I add more in, you can see more and more vessels. So now you have a difference in bone to vessels to everything else. If I keep going, you'll see everything else right there. But we can whittle away everything else, be left with the vessels, and we can keep going and just be left with the bone.
So the CT angiogram gives you this extra differentiation. It gives you this these extra information about blood vessels. It's often done for any sort of disease of the vessels. Uh, you can do it on uh, the heart vessels. You can do it in, if if there's a stent involved or something like that. It's very useful in those in those cases. So the angiogram gives you one extra step beyond this, but you usually have to inject something into the patient. Usually that something is very harmless, but it still is a little bit more invasive in that sense. Okay, and we're on our last one. And again, I appreciate all of your time. And I'm going to guess that we have a new head here. Can everybody let me know? Perfect, thank you again. Okay, so now is our MRI. And you can you should already notice that this looks a little different. In fact, it looks a little gelatinous. On the left, we have an individual who is get, who had an MRI done, and you'll notice a few little spots on her head. These are electrical leads. Uh, it's not malformations of her forehead. The electrical leads measure brain activity while you're getting an MRI, and you'll also notice there's an injury to the skull here. But you also notice that the head is just, I mean, it looks like a jello substance. Let's look at the 2D image first. So the 2D image, you see the outer bone. You see the uh, differentiation between two types of tissue in the brain. One is lighter colored, one is darker colored. And then you even have this really light colored uh, little snippets. Well, the light colored is myelin, which is like the inner cabling of the brain. The dark matter is the gray matter, which is like the, the management or the, the control centers of the brain. And we can actually scroll through it. So she has an injury to her brain. Let's figure out why. So let's actually scroll through and there it is. We have this massive growth here. That is a very, very large tumor residing in her brain. So let's see what we can do with this since it's an MRI. So we can actually cut away the top here and we can look inside. And looking inside, you actually get access to that tumor. So now you can actually see it in 3D. We can go a little further than that. So let's cut away a little bit more since we don't care about the bottom half either. Let's just leave that. Okay, and we can pull this in. So now we have the 2D image in grayscale. We have the 3D image in a, in a 2D plane here. And we have a little bit more interesting information. You can actually see some vasculature in there. You can see the myelin very clearly, and then you see kind of the, the darker areas, it's actually the, the gray matter. But we can go even further. Because it's an MRI, and MRI possess different qualities in regards to the images, we can actually flip through them, and we can start to see different information. So as we go through here, the tumor is almost gone using this view. You actually don't see much, but you see the myelin in great detail. Um, bringing it back, you actually do begin to see the tumor again. You can bring in just the grayscale, which again, you lose out on a little bit of that info. But most interestingly, because it's an MRI, we can do this. This highlights the vasculature and I believe the capillaries of the brain. So you're actually seeing all of the, the blood tracks that enter the brain. And it just so happens that we can use this and, and slowly whittle away the smaller blood vessels. And we can whittle them away little by little. And what we're left with is the blood vessels surrounding the tumor. This highlights the fact that tumors build their own blood vessels because they're selfish, they need blood, and they need food. So they build their own blood. We're actually not even looking at the tumor. This is the outer casing that was created by the, um, by, by the blood vessels. When we rotate it, you can actually see that in 3D. And we can even go even further and start just chopping away uh, the excess tissue and leave us with just the tumor. So now you have, you know, this 3D model of exactly the size of the tumor. And we can actually check that real quick, just for fun here. Oop, maybe not. My computer's freezing up on me. Um, but you can actually measure the size of it. You can actually extract out the exact location of the tumor. You can do all this thanks in part for the fact that it's an MRI. And the great thing about the about both the CT and the MRI is at the end of this image, you still have a whole human. Nothing was done or damaged to the human. Anyway, that more or less concludes uh, everything I wanted to show you guys today. I hope it was interesting. I aim it to be fun 
and I aim it to be at least insightful in a way that I don't think many uh, talks on imaging are. I, I, I try to keep it a little unique. But does anyone have any questions about um, the talk? If you have questions about the table, uh, please email me separately. Uh, we'll keep that out of this. But uh, any questions about today's talk? Let's see. Well, th thank you guys for joining. I hope it was a brief respite from being stuck at home. Uh, I personally have three daughters in a two bedroom apartment and I don't mind getting some quiet time. Uh, so I hope that it was enjoyable. If you do have any questions at all, let me go ahead and pull up my contact info one more time. Um, we'll close on that. Please email me if anything comes up. I'm happy to discuss anything in regards to imaging, anything in regards to our tables. Uh, I greatly thank you guys for joining and let me uh, speak to you on this topic for such a long time. And thank you very much.